Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Glider, medical advisor for Medscape Emergency Medicine. Joining me today to discuss the use of methoxyfluorine, or otherwise known as Penthrox, an inhaled non-opioid analgesic for the relief of acute pain, is Dr. Ken Milney, an emergency physician at Strathroy Middlesex General Hospital in Ontario, Canada, and the founder of the well-known podcast, Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. Also joining me is Dr. Sergey Motov, an emergency physician, research director at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, and also an expert in pain management. I want to welcome both of you, and thank you for joining me. Happy to be here. Ken, your recent post on Twitter regarding the utility of Penthrox in the ramped up trial really caught my attention. Um, while the trial was from 2021, it really is relevant regarding the pre-hospital management of pain in the practice of emergency medicine and certainly in hospital practice. Um, I was hoping you could review the study design, but also sort of uh, get into the, the rationale behind the use of this novel uh, uh, agent. Sure, I'd be happy to uh, kick this episode off with talking about a study that was published in 2021, uh, Academic Emergency Medicine. It was an Australian study uh, by Birchco et al. And they were doing a randomized control trial looking at methoxyfluorine versus standard care. So this was an RCT that they were looking at. And they selected out a population of adults. And they defined that as 18 to 75 years of age. They were in the pre-hospital setting, and they had a pain score of greater than eight. And then what they did was they gave them the methoxyfluorine, which is also called the green whistle, and they had them take that for their pre-hospital pain, and they compared that to just whatever your standard analgesic in the pre-hospital setting would be. And their primary outcome was, hey, how many patients had at least 50% reduction in their pain score within 30 minutes? So they recruited about 120 people. And what they found from the study was that there was no statistical difference in the primary outcome between methoxyfluorine and standard care. And again, that primary outcome that they had was a reduction in pain score by greater than 50% at 30 minutes. And there wasn't a statistical difference between the two. Um, but there are obviously limits to any study. And it was a, it was a convenient sample. Uh, this was an unmasked trial. So people knew if they were getting this green whistle which is popular in Australia, so people would be familiar with this device, and they didn't compare it to a sham or placebo group. The primary outcome wasn't met, but certainly secondary outcomes were, and there was, again, a relatively small number of patients in this trial. Um, that said, there was significant pain relief, and I think there are issues with the trial, as with any trial limitations, but um, getting to the pharmacology of Penthrox, can you describe this uh, inhaled anesthetic and how we use it, uh, specifically its role at the sub-anesthetic doses. And we so sure. medoxifluorine, uh, pentrox, is a combination of actually medoxifluorine, which is embedded in the green basal package and that whole contraption called pentrox. It's a uh, inhaled volatile fluorinated hydrocarbon uh, anesthetic that has been predominantly used, I'd say, 40, 50 years ago for the general anesthesia. And slowly but surely fell out of favor due to the fact that it can be used for the prolonged duration or in super therapeutic dose. There were cases of severe, even fatal nephro and hepatotoxicity. In late 70s, early 80s, you know, all the fluorines came on board slightly different, general, general anesthetics, and they kind of started slowly falling out of the favor. And because of this paucity and then subsequent slightly greater number of cases, FDA made a decision to pull the drug off the market in 2005. FDA successfully accomplished its mission and since then pretty much banned to use inhaled methoxyfluorine in any shape, form, and color in the United States. So now, going back to Green Whistle, has been used in Australia and probably for about what, 50 to 60 years and has been used in Europe, I'd say probably 10 to 50 to 20 years. And Ken can attest it has been used in Canada for at least a decade. And the track record is phenomenal. A, we're using sub anesthetic. Even super therapeutic dose that, based on available literature, has no incidence of this fatal hepata or nephrotoxicity. We're talking about a 10 million dose administered worldwide, except of the United States. 20 plus, 30 plus, 40 plus randomized clinical trial with over 30,000 patients enrolled in it. That proves efficacy and safety. 
And that's where we are right now in the conundrum. We have a great deal of data all over the world, except for the United States, that pushing for the use of this non-invasive, patient-controlled, non-opioid in health anesthetic, and we just don't have the access in North America. Yeah. With so exception why, of Canada. Absolutely. So why do you think the FDA, they want to be cautious, but if you look at the evidence base of data on this, it really indicates otherwise. Um, do you think that these roadblocks can be somehow overcome? Oh, the 2000s and 2010s, where everybody was focused on opioids and, and all the dangers and potential adverse events. Opioids are great drugs, like any other drug. It depends on dose and duration. And so if used properly, an excellent drug. Well, here's another excellent drug. If used properly, and the adverse events are dependent on their dose and duration. And this pentarox, methoxyfluorine, uh, it, it's a sub-therapeutic dose. It, it's a small dose. And there have been no reported um, cases of addiction or abuse related to these inhalers. Right. So that argues for the point, and I'll turn this over to you, Sergey, how, how this cannot, in my mind, be an issue that the FDA can't overcome. Well, I, I agree with you. Look, it's very hard for me to speak on behalf of FDA to, to allude to their thinking processes, but we need to be up to speed with the evidence. And you know, the first thing is, why don't you study the drug in the United States? I'm not asking you to leave the ban which you put in 2005, but why don't you honor it, what has been done over two, two decades, and at least open up the door a little bit and let us do what we do best. Why don't you allow us to do the research in the control setting? We carefully, probably select a group of patients, let's say, with, uh, with that underlying renal hepatic insufficiency, and see where we're at. Let's compare it to well, placebo. If it's not ethical, let's compare it to acts of comparators. God knows we have 15, 20 drugs we can use, and see where we're at. Can has been nothing short of support when it comes to evidence. Let us put evidence together. If there was concerns decades ago, that needs to be addressed, and then... As science becomes it, it's iterative and other information becomes available, um, the scientific method would say, let's re-examine this and let's re-examine our position and do that with evidence. And to do that, um, uh, it has to have validity within the U.S. system. So someone like you doing the research who, you know, you are a pain research guru. You should be doing this research to say, does it work or not? Does this, this uh, non-approval still stand today in 2024. Oh, I'm with you. Well, thank you for the shout out. But I agree with you, both of us, all of us, those who are interested, frontiers of emergency care, us, present clinicians, we should be doing this. And yeah, there is nothing will convince FDA more than the probably and rightly conducted research. Time to reassess the evidence and time to be less rigid. I understand you put a ban 20 years ago, but let's let's just go with the, with the science. Can I be behind it? There was an Australian study in 2022 and a very interesting uh, study out of the UK looking at life cycle impact assessment on the environment. And so if we're not just concerned about patient care, and obviously we want to provide patients with a safe and effective product uh, and compared to other products that are available that might have not as good a safety profile, uh, this looks at um, what's the impact on the environment. Um, Ken, I was wondering if you could tell me about some of your uh, recent research regarding um, the environmental effects related to um, use of, of Penthrox, but also its utility pharmacologically and how um, its mechanism of action um, actually plays out. Sure. There was a really interesting study published by Martindale back in 2024, i.e. this year, um, in the Emergency Medicine Journal. And it took a different approach to this question about could we be using this drug and why should we be using this drug? Sergey and I have already talked about, you know, the potential benefits and the potential harms. And I mentioned opioids and some of the concerns about that, how this drug, uh, you know, if we're using it in the pre-hospital setting in this little green whistle, um, the potential benefits look really good. And we, we haven't seen any of the potential harms come through in the literature. And so this was another line of evidence of why this might be a good uh, drug because of the environmental impact of this low-dose methoxyfluorine. And they compared it to nitrous oxide and said, well, what about the life cycle impact on the environment of using this? 
and said overall cradle to grave environmental impact. So, you know, obviously Sergey and I are interested in patient care and we treat patients one at a time. But, you know, we have a larger responsibility to social determinants of health like our environment. And if you look at the overall cradle to grave environmental impact of this drug, it was better than nitrous oxide when looking at specifically at climate change impact. So that might be another reason, another line of argument that could be put forward in the United States to say, we, we want to have a healthy environment and a healthy option for patients. Of course, I'll let Sergey uh, speak to anything about mechanisms of action and those types of things. As a you know, general anesthetic and, you know, hydrocarbonated volatile ones. I'm just going to stick to the area sort of because of this generalized uh, diffuse cortical depression and there's no particular channels, receptors, enzymes. So we need to be worried much about this. It just as a gas, you inhale and you put patients or people to sleep. And that's in short. And over the past uh, 40 or 30 years, and I'll go back to past decade, there are numerous studies in different countries outside of the United States, of course. And with the recent study that Kim just cited, there were conducted comparison for managing predominantly acute traumatic injuries in pediatric and adult population presenting to the EDs in various regions of the world that compared pentrox or green bissel with either placebo or active comparator and compared to parental opioids, oral opioids, ANSATs, and what have you. And the recent systematic review of one by Fabri showed out of Italy that for the ultra short-term pain relief, we're talking about 5, 10, 15 minutes, uh, inhaled metoxifluorine was found to be equal or even superior to standard of care primarily related to parental opioids. And safety was off the hook. Interestingly, with respect to analgesia, they found that geriatric patients seem to be responding more with respect to changing pain score than adult. We're talking about 18 to 65 or 65 and older. But again, we need to make sure that we carefully select those elderly people with that underlying renal hepatic insufficiency. To wrap this up, there is a positive, and there's a glut of evidence that clearly supporting its analgesic efficacy and safety, even in comparison to commonly used and traditionally accepted analgesic modalities that we use for managing pain. Thank you so much. Do you think that the use in the military will help sort of uh, propel the use uh, that may convince possibly the FDA to look at this closer? Um, because they're currently using it in, in deployed combat better in an ongoing fashion. So look, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that DOD in the United States uh, takes the lead and they're being very, very progressive. There are data that we've adopted to civilian environment by use of, you know, um, intranasal opioids and uh, intranasal ketamine and that's much of those data came out of the military. And the military is a kingdom within a kingdom. I don't know what the relation with the FDA, but I would just support the military initiative for McCullough if I need to by honoring and disseminating their research once it becomes available, but en masse is for us, non-military folks. We still need to work with the FDA. We need to convince the FDA to let us study the drug and then we need to pile the evidence in within the United States. So the FDA will start looking this favorably. Yeah. But it wouldn't hurt and it wouldn't harm. Any piece of evidence yeah. will add to the existing body of literature that we need to allow this medication to be available to us. I mean, look, it's safety in children is well established in Australia and throughout the world. So, you know, I um, mean, I think it, it deserves, I mean, a hard look and really a careful look. And the evidence, obviously, that you've both presented argues for that. Uh, the use of this uh, as a pre-hospital, but also in hospital. I guess there was concern in the hospital of, um, with underventilation, possibly uh, healthcare workers being exposed to the fumes and then getting headaches and dizziness and so forth. I don't know if that's borne out, Ken, in any of your uh, experience uh, in Canada at all. So we currently don't have it in our shop. It's uh, okay. being used in British Columbia right now in the pre-hospital setting. And I'm not aware okay. of anybody using it in their department. It's uh, used pre-hospital as far as I know. Got it. I can attest to it if I may, because I, I had familiarized myself with the device. I actually able to hold it in my hands. I never used it yet. I just saw the prototype. And the way it's set up, there is an activated charcoal chamber sits right on top of the device, which serves as the scavenger for exhaled air that contains 
part of particles of metoxyphil right. rain in theory, but I'm telling you how it is in practicality it significantly reduces occupational exposure. And the data came across to it without any specifics, while most of them did not measure the concentration of metoxyphil rain in, in ambient air in within the treatment room in the EDs. I believe the additional data source is clearly stating that it's within or even below the detectable level that would cause any harm. But once again, right. we need to honor pathology. We need to make sure that, you know, pregnant women will not be exposed to it. And healthcare professionals who are in the childbearing age. And in 2024, we also need to be concerned about aerosolizing procedures and aerosolizing treatments. Um, and just take that into account because we should be considering all the potential benefits and all the potential harms. And, uh, you know, going through COVID and stuff, there was a lot of concern about transmission and whether or not it was droplet or aerosolized. There was a observational study published in 2022 in Austria by Trimmel. Uh, in the uh, BMC Emergency Medicine Journal. Similar results. It was an observational study. It seemed to work well. Um, you know, potential harms didn't get uh, picked up, uh, but they had to stop the study early because of COVID. And so I think that we need to always focus in on what are the potential benefits, what are the potential harms, and where does the science land? Where, do, where does the data lie? And then and move forward from that and make informed decisions. Are there any key takeaways uh, you'd like to have for our audience? So I think one of the takeaways from this whole conversation is that science is iterative, science changes, and when new information comes up, we as scientists, as a researcher, <laughs> as somebody committed to great patient care, is that when new evidence becomes available and we've seen it accumulate around the world, that we should revisit our positions on this. And since there is a prohibition against this medication, I think it's time to reassess that stance and move forward and see if it still is accurate today. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with this. Thank you, Ken, for bringing this up. Great point. This has been a real, really informative discussion. I think our audience will certainly um, embrace this. So again, thank you very much for your time and uh, much appreciated.